as we return back to our seats today, we'll be entering into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word. And I invite you, once again this week, to join me in the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, the Sermon on the Mount. As we continue to examine just the opening words of the Sermon, a section that's known as the Beatitudes, which to me was best explained once as the blessed attitudes and virtues of God's kingdom and for God's people. Beautiful attitudes and virtues that truly bring upon those who live in them the smile, the approval of God, as blessed are those, blessed are they, it says. Understanding what is meant by this use of the word blessing. This word blessing here is that understanding of approval, just like the blessing a father would give to a young man to marry his daughter. He gives his approval, his blessing. And that is exactly what Jesus is saying here when he says, blessed are those, blessed are they. And I don't know about you, but doesn't bringing a smile to anyone's face bring you joy? Especially your father's face. You know, I think of my first and foremost father figure in my life, my grandfather. How much joy I would have when I would bring a smile to his face. You know, I just, those were just such special moments. You know, I longed for that smile. Here, Jesus is telling us exactly how we can bring that smile to God's face. Our ultimate heavenly father. He says, blessed are those. These beautiful attitudes and virtues that he's prescribed to us. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week in these Beatitudes, but we'll be reading them once again in the whole, as a whole because it's important for us to continue to see how each and one of these Beatitudes are built into one another and how they are here to prescribe to us the best way to live. Jesus' way, God's way, the way that he prescribed for us to be, especially with the reality of the world and its brokenness. Because we live in a world full of brokenness. And it's through these blessed attitudes, these beautiful attitudes and virtues, where we can begin to bring healing to that, that brokenness in the name of Jesus. Understanding also, that this is different from anything this world would ever prescribe for us. It is different from anything we would ever see in this world. To this world, it's very backwards. Which is why we understand that God calls us to a true, peculiar kingdom. Full of peculiar people that live in a peculiar manner. That, that sacrifice of themselves in a way that the world would never never sacrifice itself. Jesus brings us to these places so that we can have that taste of heaven here on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus calls for us to be those instruments that he uses for this. And it all takes place in how we live in and live out the Beatitudes. Starting in verse 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute, who, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, 
For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Picking up where we left off in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And what we need to notice here is there's been a dynamic shift in Jesus' teaching at this moment. In this fifth beatitude, there has been a dynamic shift that we talked about briefly last week because the first three beatitudes are known as beatitudes of aspiration, beatitudes of need, beatitudes of acknowledgement. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize their complete spiritual bankruptcy, that there is no hope outside of Jesus, that they need a Savior. They need to receive grace. They need to receive the gift of mercy that he gives. And because of this, they mourn the very reason they're in this helpless estate. Blessed are those who mourn the sin that's in them and the sin that they see around this world. And then, blessed are those who are meek. Who, who understand their condition and humbly recognize it and accept it and seek a better way, the better way, Jesus. Because blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We have those beatitudes of need, those aspirational values that Jesus prescribes for his people. But then now we have the beatitudes of action. Jesus here is calling us to action when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We need to realize that Jesus here once again is calling us to action in our poverty of spirit, our recognition of where we are at in our mourning of the sin that caused us to be there. And through that meekness he's called us to, that walking in humility, understanding who we are and who he is and what he's done. And in our hunger and thirst, he's now spurring us forth into a very active action of being merciful. Blessed are the merciful, he says, for they shall receive mercy. Showing us here in our fifth beatitude, once again, that Jesus has shifted from focusing on how we should think, respond, and feel internally to how we should think, respond, and feel externally. Where the first three Beatitudes really deals with an internal issue inside of us, the next three deal with the action externally we make in regards to it. Because mercy demands external action. Mercy demands action. Mercy is the first and foremost action that Jesus calls us, his kingdom people, to. Mercy as his kingdom people. He calls us to this action of mercy and to steal the words from Jesse from that popular 1990s sitcom, Full House. Have mercy! Have, have mercy. We have to have mercy. And we need to understand that that is not an easy task because when we understand what mercy really is, when we understand what mercy really takes, it does not come naturally to us in our sinful estate. Because of our poverty of spirit, because of our sin in our lives, because of our inability to recognize that and to fight against it sometimes in our lives, in our flesh, we're at war with this because we don't want to be merciful. The world teaches us the opposite of mercy. In fact, when we were talking about those beatitudes of the world, the opposite would be blessed are the vengeful. For they shall be feared. And in this, and this is the way of the world, it's hard for us to conceptualize at what mercy actually is, what mercy actually looks like. Even in the church, we struggle with this. In fact, we often confuse mercy with something else in the church. We talk about God's mercy and grace. But here's the thing. Grace is not mercy. Mercy is not grace. Grace is that unmerited favor of God given to us. And mercy is the product of that grace. Because of God's unmerited favor for us, that yet while we were sinners, Jesus still came and died for us. He has bestowed upon us this great mercy. Grace and mercy are two different things. And we need to understand that. Grace, once again, being the unmerited favor. Mercy 
being the product of that grace. Understanding that we did not deserve it, nor did we earn it, as that famous contemporary worship song says, reckless love, yet you give yourself away. It is in this, through grace, this unmerited and undeserved favor of God that God has shown us mercy. And you know what? Google actually does a pretty good job at defining mercy. If you look up what is the definition of mercy, you'll find a pretty good definition. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Mercy is compassion. Mercy is forgiveness. Mercy is compassion and forgiveness in action. Because both compassion and forgiveness demand action on our part. You don't have it without action. And let me explain what I mean. You can have all the compassionate feelings in the world you want about someone, but if you, all you have is compassionate feelings, your compassionate feelings are meaningless. Because they do nothing. They just make you feel a certain way. Mercy takes more than just compassionate feelings. Mercy requires action. We must never be tricked into thinking that we're living out this blessed attitude, this beautiful attitude and virtue of being merciful because we feel compassionate. True mercy demands action. Mercy is compassion in action. I think about the parable of the Good Samaritan that's found in the Gospel of Luke. In particular, what it is that Jesus asked of the person who asked, you know, well, you know, tell me, who is my neighbor then? To that lawyer that comes up to him to challenge him, and then he tells him that parable. And, and, you know, the person says, you know, you need to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And then it is there where he then tells him, well, the lawyer says, well, then who is my neighbor? You know, hoping he can justify himself, thinking, you know what, I'm pretty good to my neighbors. You know, I like my next-door neighbors. I talk to them. You know, I might even pray for them every once in a while. But who is my neighbor? And what Jesus makes it clear in this parable of the Good Samaritan, everybody. And he asked them in verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And if you don't recall this narrative, you don't recall this, this moment, it's in Luke chapter 10, and I encourage you to look at it afterwards, to dig into that afterwards. And I have the reference on the back of your worship sheets today. You know, he talks about this man who fell among robbers and was left on the side of the road to die. And then the priest came by. And he's like, ooh, I'm going to go over here instead of over there. And, uh, you know, all the religious leaders, the religious establishment passed by. But then the Samaritan came. We know this. We know this. The Samaritan came. And as we've talked about in the past, the Samaritans were despised by the Jews. The Samaritan came and cared for the man. He bound his wounds. He took him to an inn to help him heal. He paid for all the cost. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Go and do likewise, Jesus said. Show mercy. Live in mercy. Don't just think compassionately. Go and do something about those compassionate feelings. So often we equate our mercy to how we feel about something when we, the church, are called to an action, not just a feeling. The truly merciful don't just feel. They act in a manner able to alleviate the suffering of the one needing mercy. Even if you were just alleviating it, just a finger, just a finger's worth of pulling, we are trying to actively do something to alleviate the pain, to alleviate the suffering. I think of a famed historical moment that a preacher once talked about, about a 19th century Western pastor who was at a horse funeral. And in the early 19th century, the death of a horse was a big deal. And this horse was accidentally killed by a, a neighbor of this man. And his family was going to suffer greatly because of the loss of their horse. Their horse was part of their livelihood. It helped them on their farm. It helped them take care of business. And it provided so much income for their family. It provided transportation for them. And it was now gone. And everybody was giving words of sympathy. And there's nothing wrong with words of sympathy. There's nothing wrong with coming alongside someone and encouraging them and, and providing them those, you know, I'm so sorry you're going through this. But if words of sympathy are all we have, we, we're forgetting the other things we have. Prayer. The power of prayer. 
and then just what's in our hand. That what is present with us. And so there was a pastor here at this horse funeral, and everybody was being very sympathetic towards the man who lost his horse, this family that lost his horse. And the pastor says, you know, I'm also sorry. He pulled off his hat. He pulled out a $5 bill and put it in the hat. And he says, I'm $5 sorry. How sorry are you? And he passed the hat. And they collected a ton of money for this family that they were able to buy a new horse. They were able to alleviate that burden. And back then, $5 was a big deal. But the point is, it was in his hand. It was something he had that he could give. It was a way that he could show an action of mercy and do something about it. You know, Jesus actually condemns the Pharisees for not even being willing to lift a finger to help those who are in need of mercy. He calls us to an active life of mercy. And what we need to understand is that this requires sacrifice. Jesus shows us mercy through the ultimate sacrifice. It calls us to be self-sacrificial in our approach to others. It requires us to give of ourselves for the others, to provide more than just sympathy, but to actually provide relief. True mercy demands action. True mercy demands sacrifice. It is not a compassionate feeling. Rather, it is compassion in action. You know, when I think about this, I think of how there's a great how difference coming up just around the corner, February 14th, right? What is it that you say at every how meeting about one woman does? One woman with $10 can provide lunch. So everybody heard this. Um, 10 women with 100 or $10 can buy a woman groceries. 100 women with $10 can really make a difference. And so when we come together, when we each put our little bits together, our little fingers together in mercy and compassion for another, we can truly make a dramatic and transformative difference in their life. So don't ever think, my little bit isn't enough to really even help. Your little bit matters. Don't sell yourself short. God has gifted each and every one of us with great ability to provide mercy to those who need mercy. And as Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy demands action. I think about what the Bible actually teaches about this. You know, James 2, 15, 16 actually says this. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? I also think about 1 John 3, 17 through 18. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother's brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The call of the word of God, the call of Jesus, can't be more clear to us. Mercy demands action, powerful action, self-sacrificial action on the one who is being merciful. Beyond compassion, mercy demands forgiveness. Another very powerful action that really demands self-sacrifice. It demands us to sacrifice our need for retribution, our need to get even. Remember, blessed are the vengeful, for they shall be feared. That's what the world teaches us, to get what's yours. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And we need to understand what it means to be forgiving, what it means to be merciful in this way, the way that Jesus was merciful for us. It means to unburden those who have wronged us with the burden of the wrong they have committed to us, to relinquish that from them. And it also means to relinquish the bitterness and the malice that we're holding in our heart, because that is a poison to your soul. There is no better example than Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. 
But there's another potent example, not as powerful, but just as important that the Old Testament teaches us, that the biblical history teaches us, of a guy named Joseph and his brothers, found in Genesis 37 through 50. Another section of scripture I just encourage you to read through. And what you learn is that Joseph, he was hated by his brothers. He was really hated by his brothers because he was the favorite. And he was, he was the, the youngest, too, next to Benjamin, his brother. But he was the youngest of all the older brothers, obviously. If he has older brothers, he's the youngest of them. The point being, he wasn't supposed to be the favored one. Reuben, the firstborn, was supposed to be the favored one. And boy, his brothers hated him for it. And you know what? Joseph didn't help that at all because Joseph had a way of rubbing the fact that he was the favorite in front of all of his brothers' faces. Well, it says that they hated him all the more for that. Hated him to the point that they conspired to kill him. They conspired to kill him, but then there's grace. They give him some grace. They see a caravan coming down the road. They're like, oh, it's an Egyptian caravan. We can sell him as a slave instead. You know, what a grace and mercy. Those brothers, they were just so loving, weren't they? They, that's his only saving grace, is that instead of being killed, they sold him as a slave in Egypt. And if you know the story, and if you can go back and read this history that we find in Genesis, you find that Joseph doesn't stay a slave, but he rises to a position of authority in Egypt, one where he is next to Pharaoh. He runs the show, pretty much, for Pharaoh. He becomes second in command of everything in Egypt. And then he has his brothers at his mercy. Because there was a great famine, and only Egypt had food, and his brothers came all the way to Egypt to get food, and there's Joseph in the judgment seat. He is in the judgment seat. He could have gave them what they deserved. But instead, he showed mercy. He forgave them. He gave them compassion. And he did it with very powerful actions. How could anyone do that? I mean, these, they were going to kill him. And then they almost did the worst thing. They sold him as a slave. I mean, who would rather be sold as a slave? I don't know if any of us would. Because that's like a death sentence in itself. Who could do that? It is not the way of this world. To understand this, to be able to do this, we have to learn to receive and live in those first few Beatitudes that Jesus gives us. Because to be forgiving like Joseph, to be forgiving like that, we understand something about ourselves, that we too are wretched sinners. We too have evil within us. We too have this desperate, poor estate of being spiritually bankrupt, that there is nothing good within us. And we too needed mercy. We, too, needed forgiveness from God. We needed Jesus. And we mourn over the sin of our sin and the world's sin, the sins of our brothers and sisters around us. We mourn over it because we know that there is a better way. And when we can recognize that and be humble, being meek, understanding that, yes, I'm a sinner, too, and just like this person that I can't forgive needs forgiveness, I need to recognize I needed the same forgiveness. And thanks be to God that yet while I was a sinner, Jesus died for me. Understanding the same weakness of sin that is in us is in them. And just like we needed mercy, so do they. When we understand the mercy that Jesus has given us, it helps us open in mercy to others. Because mercy demands action. It demands sacrifice on the part of the merciful, just like Jesus. This is why I believe there is such a great reward for mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, we need to understand something here, because a lot of people un just don't get this. We aren't given mercy from God because we are merciful. We're given mercy because we have grace. There's nothing that, you can't show enough mercy in this life to receive the mercy of God. But what happens when we receive that mercy from God, we are open to mercy, we are open to that work God is doing in us that we want others to receive it too. And by letting others receive it, guess what we do? We receive more. How is it we receive more? Because when you can let go of all that bitterness, 
when you can let go of all that wrath inside of you, that, that malice inside of you towards another person, there is freedom and there's forgiveness. Because we know that Jesus calls us to forgiveness, to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. He says in the very same sermon in Matthew 6, 14 through 15, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You know, I think of another famed parable, the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 23 through 35. And I want to read this one in the full because it's so important for us to understand this idea, this call that God has given us to live out mercy in action. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him. He began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And that they there, I, I want to talk about the they there. Blessed are the most merciful, for they, that is pungent. That is really forceful. They, only they, we can add those words, only they will receive that mercy in return. Showing mercy demands action. It demands compassion. It demands forgiveness. Not just feelings, but actual action. Bringing us to the violent test of faith. That this one verse, this simple one verse, commands of us to make, demands of us to take, a test that cuts as deep as God's words intended to. That double-edged sword, as the author of Hebrews says, that cuts marrow and bone. First, understanding mercy is a lived compassion and action. If we have no mercy toward those who are in physical, emotional, and spiritual distress, if we are unwilling to even sacrifice even a little, to lift a little bit of a finger, the slightest relief in someone's life, we must ask, is the mercy of God even in us? And then secondly, we need to ask. We need to ask the question, are we walking in forgiveness towards others? Because if we are harboring anger, if we are harboring malice, if we're harboring all those things that Jesus tells us to put off, if we are unable to forgive, we need to ask, is the forgiveness of God in us? Because it's through the receiving of the forgiveness of God that we become more and more forgiving. And we experience the freedom there is. But we must be checked if we harbor rage and bitterness in our heart towards others. We must be checked if we haven't passed the test of mercy. Are we in mercy? We must ask. There's a story that, I perf that perfectly encapsulates all of this, I believe, that I found from a sermon that was preached in Waco, Texas in the 1980s. And it was said to be a true story, 
course, I couldn't chase down the original source because I had to buy a book and it wouldn't have gotten here on time. But it's said to be a true story. It says, years ago, a small town merchant had identical twin boys who were inseparable. They were so close that they even dressed alike. When their father died, they took over the family business. Their relationship was considered a model of creative collaboration. Because he was busy, one of the brothers neglected to ring up a sale and absentmindedly left a dollar bill on top of the, red, the cash register while he went to the front of the store to wait on another customer. Remembering the dollar bill was there, he returned to deposit it only to find the bill was gone. <gasps> Intrigue. <laughs> he asked his brother if he had seen it, but the brother said he had not. An hour later, he asked his brother again, but this time with that obvious note of suspicion, his brother became angry and defensive. Every time they tried to discuss the matter, the conflict grew worse, culminating in a vicious set of charges and countercharges. The incredible outcome was a disillusion of their partnership and the installation of a partition wall down the center of the business. And one store became two competing businesses. And this continued for 20 years. One day, a car with an out-of-state license plate pulled up in front of the store. A well-dressed man entered one brother's shop and asked how long the store had been there. Learning it had been about 20 years since that division, he said, then you are the one with whom I must settle an old score. Some 20 years ago, I was out of work, drifting from place to place, and I happened to get off a boxcar in your town. I had absolutely no money. I had not eaten for three days. As I was walking down the alley behind your store, I looked in through the window and saw the dollar bill on top of the cash register. Everyone else was in the front of the store. I had been raised in a Christian home, and I had never before in all my life stolen anything, he said. But that morning, I was so hungry. I gave in to the temptation, slipped through the door, and took that dollar bill. That act has weighed on my conscience ever since, and I decided that I would never be able to find amends until I made it right. Here is the dollar, and tell me what else I owe you for appropriate damages. When the stranger finished his confession, he was amazed to see the old store owner shaking his head in deep sorrow and beginning to weep. Finally, the old man grabbed the man and said, could you tell the store to the, the, the owner of the store right next door? And the man complied, the stranger complied, only this time to find two old men who looked almost identical, weeping side by side. From a distance, we cannot see whether the two brothers professed to be believers or even were church growers. Given the time of this culture, the early 1900s, we definitely know that they most likely weren't that enthusiastic churchmen. That was a big part of the culture and the place that this was. They could have even been evangelicals. But whatever their spiritual profession, their mercilessness, unforgiving spirits revealed the hearts that they had never understood the mercy of God. For if they had, they themselves would have been merciful to one another. Even if not at first, they would have understood they could forgive one another because Jesus first forgave them. The fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is the perfect corrective for all those caught in the bitterness of offense. Knowing bitterness is like swallowing poison and hoping someone else would die from it. If you have problems similar to these two unhappy brothers, this beatitude is for you. This beatitude is for all of us. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Lord Jesus, as we go into a time to respond and reflect upon what it is you've brought to us in your word today, show us the action of mercy you are calling us to right here, right now. Show us how it is that we could live and walk in mercy, just as we have received mercy from you. Amen.